Okay. So uh, we're here to talk for a little while about Pixie provision and migrating Pixie provision. So we have a lot of customers uh, who are very interested in upgrading and modernizing their physical provisioning infrastructure. That's what Racken does. Uh, but they already have something. So they have Pixie and Cobbler or Mass or Foreman. They, they've already gotten infrastructure that's providing the service. Often they have multiple infrastructures providing the service. And so we've been putting a lot of thought into how do we help customers who have provisioning migrate to something new. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they don't want to just toss out one and do a big switch migration. They need to do it incrementally. And so we've been working with customers. We can't tell you the, the who's, but we can tell you the sort of the what's. Uh, to describe what they're doing. So I asked Greg Althaus to sit down and, and sort of walk us through these scenarios, the gotchas, uh, and some ways that, that you can really build a parallel path uh, provisioning infrastructure and have the best of both, right? So a gradual migration uh, that, that gets you to where you want to go pretty quickly. So, Okay. So let's set up a scenario and kind of walk through that. It's kind of an idea to get a baseline. So say I have 10 servers, that I've got running in a couple different subnets, and I have a DHCP server that I'm using to boost in, and I have Cobbler running as my provisioning system, and they're already installed. I don't want to do anything, but I can get on the boxes, right? I can SSH into them and run the script. Pretty, pretty typical. So that's a normal kind of environment. So one of the challenges that we keep running into or seeing is people are like, I understand this, I've got it, I, it makes sense to me, but we're like, but you could do so much more with these other tool sets. So how do you transition from one to other in an incremental and a safe fashion? So one of the things that we've been thinking through is if you're like using digital rebar provision, you could set up ERP for that environment. You could then define the subnet that you So that's, that's not going to automatically take over your environment. Right, right. Start so in fact, ERP starts empty with no subnets configured, right? It doesn't know about your machine, so it's not going to do anything to you. Okay. So then the next step would be to say, okay, let me define some subnets to serve the HTTP, but let's not serve the HTTP. So we'll disable those subnets, right? So we can configure them and bring them up. Right, because so you can only have one DHCP server in an environment. Well, that's not completely true. Oh, what? So okay. you can have multiple DHCP servers in the same environment. The main goal is to make sure that they don't respond to this machine to the same IP. Okay. Or so, and so one one DHCP server can just sort of ignore. Say I don't know about any. I, I don't know who you are. I'm not talking to you, but I know you are. I'll, I'll have a conversation. Yeah. So so, so what we would do is we'd set up a <laughs> we'd set up a subnet and not have it not be on. That way we could get all the IP configured ranges and subnets and options the way we want. Then what we could do is we could say okay, work only in reservation mode. So that means only respond to things that have been explicitly given IP addresses to a MAC address, right? Okay. So you would then say, okay, I want to, so I've kind of got that idea set up so I can have IP configured, right, and created. So then it's like, okay, I want to figure out what's running. So we at Rackin have kind of made a script that you could then run on your machine to register it with digital rebar provision. So the idea is then you could take this script and as part of its process, discover your environment. But since ERP doesn't have DHCP control, it can't take over your machine. You continue to boot and operate in your normal way. So wait, wait but hold on a second. So the normal process for DRP is the DHCP responds, it gives you a, a discovery image. The discovery image has, has the script inside of it that registers the machine for you. And then from there, you, you have control. You're saying you can skip the DHCP part, you just run a, a, a variant of that script, registers in DHCP, but the, the, DRP. Boot, the DRP, sorry, in DRP, and then that, so that will give you the control that you want when well, you want it? it at least gives you the visibility to start with. Okay. So the idea is that DRP doesn't know anything, and your existing systems know something, or they don't know something, which is probably the bigger problem, but you've got them configured and running. What you're doing with this, what we call a join script, is joining the nodes, giving that information to DRP, so at least can start presenting to you what's installed, what's running, what IPs are where. Like if you have out of band management configured, the script could be set to put that kind of information up as well. Okay. So all of that's in DRP, but it's still passive system. Right? But couldn't I just, 
dump all that stuff in the database? Just write a script? Sure, you could. But if you, but what we found in a lot of our customers is if you're looking at DRP as a way to move forward, you may not have the control you wanted of the systems anyway, so yeah. you don't trust it. So this way you can go to the machines you know you have, the nodes that are doing the things you want for you, run the script, inventory the nodes, have them. Uh, and, 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 and this that, might be a case where like you don't even know the IP addresses that are assigned to a machine. This would right. like, this would like you you collect all, all that information, but so you'd actually get the full inventory. You would get the, the deep scan of the machine that DRP would give you. Potentially, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So now you have now you have this database. Now you have two two DHCPs that could respond. Well, I, but we haven't turned them on yet. So what we've done is as part of the script's job is to create a reservation in the DRP DHCP server that says this MAC address should be this IP. Okay. So now when you're ready to start taking a machine over at a time, right, or it's like, okay, I finally can reprovision machine one. What I can do is go into my existing DHCP server and say, don't respond to this MAC address. Hmm, okay. And then I go turn on in DRP. So like an anti-reservation. Kind of, yeah. You okay. basically say, quit, ignore this guy. Got it. So now you reboot the node. As a node reboots because the DHCP process, the DRP DHCP server responds. Okay. And now you have DRP taking over the full control lifecycle of that system. And this works because you have the, the MAC addresses for the machine in this right. case. So, so you, need, you can't tell either system to, to handle reservations the way you're talking about without the MAC address. So the join script gives you the MAC address in DRP, and then that allows you to then go tell the other DHCP. Could you automate that process? Um, depending on the DHCP server, <laughs> I guess. But the whole point is and the control most you DHCP have, right? servers don't have an API endpoint to drive in a oh. programmatic session. Oh, that's anyway, why you wrote DHCP. That's why, yeah, okay. that's probably in one DRP. of the reasons you might be using DRP anyway. Right? So, but the neat thing about this is then you can move machines one at a time in a controlled fashion where you're not necessarily risking a whole big bang kind of upgrade. The other thing that you can do is once you can leave your existing provision system in place running the way you want. So your DHCP server, if you're doing like dynamic discovery and all that stuff where if you don't see it, it comes up and joins, right? That can still be handled by your existing system. Once you're comfortable, what you can then do is say, the HCP server, my original one, quit responding to unknown machines. Only respond to machines I know about. Okay. You can then go and change the DHCP server in DRP to say you are now no longer reservation only. So it'll it'll still honor reservation, right. but any new machine it sees, it'll actually start giving addresses. Okay, so that would that would effectively be the big switch. When 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 you do that action. DRP basically owns your data center. Any machine well, reboots? Well, no, no, no. Oh, the point is, okay. say, say I have a mixed set of things, right? Well, yeah, it ends up, I mean, kind of. It doesn't have to, depending on how you run, the more specific response from the original DHCP server will still be taken. Okay. Uh, assuming same clients. And most clients are kind of same, where they'll continue talking to the machine they were talking to. So, I mean, there were... But yeah, there's yeah, still a risk. So at so, that point, you need to be ready to handle full discovery. Originally, when we were talking about this, we assumed, I assumed, that we would do a DHCP forwarder. So you would you would basically say, hey, here's the DHCP server area of running. Forward the, 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 the next boot request to, to rebar, and that would be the way you'd handle it. This is a little bit more integrated from that perspective, right? Because we're actually trying to take down the old DHCP server. Is that right. the goal? Eventually, yeah. You want to replace that and have the more integrated story that you can do programmatic control again. So now, interestingly enough, if you are using the HTTP helpers, HTTP forwarders, those things, most of them allow you to specify multiple server destinations. And so you would put both the original DHCP server and the new GRP server in place, and then the switch was into both, and then depending on which one had the configuration for the node at the time, would respond. That way you have a controlled migration. Wait, wait, so, so that one, you said a couple of things that, that, that I, I lost track of. So let me, let me back up. In, so the switch is actually doing the boot, the boot, the next boot forwarder, right? So well, so in that case. if you're, if, say I have five subnets, okay. I probably don't have five interfaces on my DHCP server. Okay. So, 
So I need something that will take the DHCP request because that's only within a single subnet. It's not routable. Needs yeah, to be so sent over packet, to, yeah. right. Needs to be sent over to the DHCP server. Okay. Usually that's done through a switch helper called a VT forwarder or a DHCP helper. So this and isn't that, some server sitting off on the side. No, it's usually, actually happening at the switch. It's in the switch. Okay. Usually. So the switch forwards this request. You, you're, you're saying the forward, the switch could actually forward to multiple DHCP servers. Yeah, That's most, a redundancy type of. Most yeah, most modern switches have the ability to specify a list of forwarders. And then so what you would do is you would set up it would you set up two forwarders and then the the old system would respond and DHCP could respond, and you would actually do the same type of drain ad where you would say, hey, DHCP, you should respond to this server, the, the request from the switch, really. And, and and digital rebar can actually be set up on a server-by-server -server basis to respond or not. Subnet by subnet basis. Subnet by subnet basis. As well as subnet basis as well as server basis. Oh, so at a very generic level, a request comes in for a subnet, we, we respond to it, and so on the other side, on your, your legacy system, you'd be able to shut off responding on specific subnets as you went. That's another way to do it as well. Okay. Wow. So in that case, you would you would be able to not have to do all the MAC address and pre-discovery pieces. In this case, uh, you could rely on default behaviors out of digital rebar and sort of do a switch at a time migration. Yeah, subnet at a time. Okay. Well, yeah, switch at a time, in general, a switch is the forwarder for a subnet. So if you had multiple switches, you, you, you may have multiple forwarders, but the idea is that it's a layer two function. It's not necessarily directly related to the switch. So it doesn't really matter if the DHCP server gets five requests for the same reason. So, so, I mean, these are pretty incremental stages, right? I could set up a new system. It's not going to break anything. I can move one server at a time. I could move a subnet at a time over. How long would it take to go through this whole process? Right, I have, a, I have an active data center. Um, I don't want to mess with production loads. I've got a couple of, of windows where things are going to go through. I mean, how, how, what does it look like to actually do a rollout like this? So the time is going to depend upon how much control you have already. So, okay. You need to be able to run this join script on every system. Well, if that's a manual process because you don't have some kind of uh, automated place, you know, mechanism to touch all of your servers, then that's however it takes for you to run a script on all your nodes, right? If they're all known in an Ansible playbook or something like that, right, or some other tool that could run scripts in places, then just running the script is easy. Okay. So that's fine. So then that's, you know, hours, you know, it depends on how many nodes you have. But then you could pull out. So you, you just, the discovery is fast. You can get a full right. inventory with the discovery. So then it becomes a matter of how comfortable you are with changing the DHCP server over okay. and how much validation you need. So Between. you could do a cascading. You could do one server, make sure everything looks cool. We had a customer who was doing that. They would, they literally could, they were running, they actually had to re subnet things. So they had a, a, a sort of a switch that would, would then, they did a little, they did, they did it. Very belt and suspenders, which can be good if you have the, the chops. They had a lot of chops where they actually changed the subnet routing for DHCP server for provisioning only responds during a very narrow window. So they turn on um, a subnet, uh, layer two subnets to one provisioning system. They turn on, they have a switch, they turn on it to digital rebar, and then they're, they're bouncing, they can bounce back and forth on a machine by machine basis. Um, what you're suggesting is something that doesn't require that level of control. <laughs> no, and okay. in some regards, this would be, you would start off doing a couple, and it may actually, the timing of it may actually depend more on when you choose to interrupt or take the potential interruption in the production. Okay. Right? You could sit latent for weeks, months, whatever, waiting for your window to actually say, okay, we now can drive some of these production systems. Okay. But you could do one system, make sure, well, I mean, assuming we're, we're talking about racks of gear. So right. one, you might reboot one system into the new, make sure it was cool, right. do a couple of systems and say, hey, this looks like the process is working, and yeah. then flip it over without doing all the, without staging all the reboots. That's right. Um, that makes sense. Then you can leave both systems up so everything's happy. Um, yeah. 
from that perspective. And it says, what would happen if you accidentally forgot to remove the old entries from the old DHCP service? Besides chaos. Um, the machine will most likely boot what they were booting before, right? So whatever state you left the DHCP server in on the previous one, so it might be telling the system to do locally, okay, that's fine. That'll continue to function. Um, what what about I mean I know we added this thing called uh, proxy mode, which is which yeah. is sort of head exploding to me because it's two DHCP servers coexisting. Um, could you like leave a DHCP server running and then say but don't handle boot anymore? Is that the idea? You could. Um, so that's a no, more advanced way to try and handle the problem. Is you leave your existing DHCP server running to hand out IP addresses. But you put the DHCP server running on DRP in what we call proxy mode, where it will watch for DHCP traffic and then follow with an additional offer from itself telling the boot file. What that would require is that once you're ready to try and use DRP for provisioning, you would configure your existing DHCP server not to specify a next server for a boot file. And you could do that per set of machines. And then as DRP sees those machines put to the next time, it would try and inject its information into that machine's workflow and take it over. Um, so that, that requires a little more skill in your DHCP and control on your DHCP server. Right? But it, you if, may not be ready for it. But if you've got a DHCP server that's, used, it's, that's integral into a couple of different processes, and IP assignment's really important for you, and you've got a whole sort, you know, it, your bailing wire and the duct tape depends on that DHC server knowing addresses or something like that. This would let you not disrupt that part of the infrastructure and but but remove boot provision from it. And so you sort of you can sort of get the best of both worlds. It, it sort of feels like an edge case for us. We actually added the proxy pieces for home labs for people who are booting machines at home but still need to boot provision and they don't want to turn off their Wi-Fi gateway. Um, there's a very specific use case there. Yeah, but. There's, there is a lab use case in some of them where um, we had one customer working on a lab, and the lab basically provided basic DHCP services to get addressing, but didn't and couldn't and didn't really want to deal with the lab need to reprovision system. So they said, okay, well, run this proxy server next to it and just inject when you want to provision systems, the actual boot file the system should boot from. And so it sounds like a home case, but in this case it was a lab infrastructure where they had one group managing the IP space for the lab, but not necessarily provisioning of the lab. So it was kind of an interesting case. So thank you for spending some time with us, uh, listening to us talk about some of our, our battle scars and, and challenges. We, we also know that every environment's a little bit different. Um, and we would love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about what you're trying to figure out and, and face because there's some cases where we have simple solutions and there's some cases where there's great ideas about how we can make digital rebar provision a better experience for people by adding APIs or adding command wedges or adding imports, right? There's, there's a lot of things that we can do to help. Uh, and in some cases, if we can't help, we can at least commiserate um, with you know, the, the crazy ways that people have stitched together provisioning infrastructure. Um, we've seen everything, and so we, we know how hard this is. We build digital rebar to try and make it so that we're not gonna, you know, repeat the sins of the past where you have to SSH in, run a local command line, and pray that it works, um, and then automate that. Um, I, it's just the way ops has been, and, and we're really, really working hard to try and make it better. We hope that uh, you'll, you'll work with us and be, be part of what we're trying to build with digital rebar provision and, and make operations suck less uh, <laughs> as, as a reality. Uh, with that, any last comments? Excellent. Thank you for, for listening. I hope this was helpful.